Well, my name is Wilford Odell Green. September the 19th, 1926. I was named Wilford Odell because my mother wanted my initials to be the same as her dad, and it was W.O. Carden. Well, when I, I didn't know, I was a little W.O. till I got started high school. And then I found out it was Wilford, and I never had heard that name, and I kind of gave mom a, I said, why didn't you name me William? She said, you got a, you, both granddads are William, William Carden, William Henry Green, and Uncle Bill Green is a William, and I'm fed up with Williams. So she named me Wilford Odell, <laughs> so I'll have a W.O. So I have a little W.O. till I started high school. Let me make one adjustment here. And Okay, okay. Uh, is it okay if I just call you W.O.? Yeah. Okay, well, uh, some people. That's me. <laughs> uh, tell me, now, you weren't born in southeast Missouri. Tell me, uh, where, where were you born? Tell me a little bit about that. I was born in Battle Creek, Michigan, Cyril City. That's where Kellogg's and Post are. And uh, my dad's older brother, was in World War One, and he went to all oh, the encampment up there where he trained and got acquainted with people uh, in the army. And got it when he got discharged, he went up there and got him a job and had a good job, and uh, with post. And uh, so he called my dad. And of course, down at Dorena, they didn't have any nothing but farming. So we moved, they moved up there, and I was born there. Him and mother, had just, they hadn't been married too long, a year maybe. And uh, I was born up there in September of 26, and we lived there till, sep till uh, 19 and 29. And my mother had a, a little girl, married Loris, and uh, my grandmother Carden raised so much canes about her not being able to see her grandkids that my dad and them moved back to Dorena. <laughs> uh, and uh, we lived there until uh, I was 14. Things got bad there, so we moved back to Battle Creek because my uncle had got had got a place for dad to go to work if he wanted to, so we moved back up there. And uh, we lived up there uh, for about three years or four, and then we moved back to Dorena. My granddad needed help He on the farms. He had built him a store, a little store down there, and uh, he was running that store, and he needed somebody to run the farm, so Dad went down there and took over it. Then uh, I was about 14, and then uh, a place come open up there, uh, 180, well, it was 200 acres. My dad bought a woods that the three states had cleared off most of the choice timber, but we still had to clear the ground, of, and it, uh, it, it was people in the winter didn't have nothing to do. They come up there and clear an acre of ground. They get paid. I don't remember not much. And uh, the, the whole family had come up there. And in three years, we was farming the whole place with a one-row operation. He'd lay off a row, and I'd come behind with a one-mule planter in there and plant it, and it covered up. And uh, when you plowed it, you plowed a half a row with a double shovel. That double shovel had two points on it, and you go down one side, and then you'd have to come back up the other side, and you hit a stump, you're going to go down. Them handles would come back. <laughs> and uh, 
So when I got 17, the war was going on, and I couldn't wait to get out of them stumps and roots. So I joined the Navy. I was 17, and they sent me to Farragut, Idaho. Well, let, let, let me, uh, you, you, <clears throat> you joined the Navy. Now, people who know Dorena, Missouri, it's, except for the Mississippi River, it's about the middle of the landlocked areas you could get. How in the world did you decide to go to the Navy as opposed to, because World War II, you knew you were going to be drafted. I guess. How did you end up deciding to go to the Navy? Tell me that story. Well, I, talk, I, I thought about it, and uh, they was telling me the Marines wore rough, said, in the Army you march and you sleep on the ground and everything, the Navy you got your bed with you, you got your clothes with you, you on a ship, you don't have to march. And you, it was the easiest way out I could find, I thought. So uh, I, that's the reason I, I did, and I, I took boot camp in Farragut, Idaho. And uh, up there at the lakes, you know, and uh, the one there close, they said... Uh, if you will, uh, I said, can we go home back home? He said, but you can go back home for a month, but you'll be training in Farragut, Idaho. We didn't care, so we did. Well, Farragut, Idaho, for those not familiar with the state, it's pretty landlocked. You don't expect the Navy to be doing any kind of boot camp or anything like that in, in basically a mountainous area, but you were about as far from the ocean as you could get in Farragut, Idaho, weren't you? Yeah, but there was a huge lake up there, Lake Ponderay. It's spelled P-E-N-D-O-R-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, but it's, that's French or something, I don't know. It's Ponderay is the way it is. And they had six big camps up there they built, for training sailors. And they were named after five pilots that got killed, aircraft, uh, Air Corps men, and they named uh, named all of them companies different. Uh, Scott and Eisen Walter, and that was the last name of one of them pilots, you know. And uh, that's where I got my training. And I went to firefighting schools up there, the Navy and the SIS, because if your ship gets on fire and you can't put it out, you're in trouble. You know, <laughs> so that's how I come into getting on the fire department later when I got back from, well, I was out a good while before I got on the fire. I was selling meat farmer packing company and first one thing or another, and then uh, they was building this big plant out here, and they couldn't get any police or firemen at all. They was getting that big money. People were living in their cars here and renting the bathroom facilities from the uh, gas stations and things. And um, so I checked on it and I decided to join the Paducah Fire Department. So they taught you to fight fires in the Navy? I went to two firefighting schools in the Navy, yeah. They taught everybody, because, you know, if you, if you can't put fire out on your ship, you're going to be in trouble. Well, let, let's talk about your your time in the military. We're, we're going to be going all over the place. Here. Okay. Uh, the, uh, when you, uh, where was, uh, what theater were you stationed in? In the Pacific or Atlantic, or what, what was the theater? Okay. After we graduated from training, we got 12 days leave. It took me four days to get home. I was home four days and four days to get back to camp. And they put me in OGU, that's outgoing unit, and stayed there till I got assigned a ship. And they sent me to Treasure Island, California. And we stayed there till I got our ship built in Mare Island. There they had a, 
and I was, I was wanting to get on me a destroyer or a DE, destroyer escort or something. You know what I got on? A distilling ship. There wasn't before of them in the Navy. We furnished drinking water for the Fifth Fleet when we got over there. But when we left, we went by Hawaii, and we were supposed to stop there and picked up five pilot, five officers, but we was by it before they decoded the message. So we went on to the Marshall Islands. There was two of them there, Kwajalein and Anna Weetok. Don't tell me, don't ask me to spell them now. And we stayed there a while, and then the Navy had a secret base on Ulithi in the Caroline Islands. And that was weird. It had a big harbor there, and the harbor was surrounded by a coral fence. When, when the tide was out, you could see the top of them. And it, they had to cut a hole in that and put the, let the ships go through, but they put a submarine, anti-sub net in there, then, you know. And uh, we stayed there, and they called us. Uh, Guam's water system went out on them. They didn't have drinking water on a whole island. So we took off for, for Guam and the Marianas. And we got up there and stayed. It took us about 10 days till they got it fixed up. You know, we just furnished water, drinking water for them. We had a laboratory on the ship, and our tanks were checked every day. We had a 4.8 million gallon storage capacity. We could convert 120,000 gallon in 24 hours from seawater to drinking water. And then we went back to Ulithi, and we stayed there, and they got ready to invade Okinawa. They rendezvoused there. We went to bed one night, and it was just a normal amount of service ships in there. Next morning, we got up, and as far as you could see, the, all you could see was mass. They call it hull down. You couldn't see the hull, just, and it looked like a forest that had lost all their trees. <laughs> And we worked three days and nights constantly for those little ships that didn't have any way of converting water. So we have, uh, like LSTs that would be loaded with men, we'd furnish them with fire hose. And I got up one morning, went out there, and there were six on each side of us waiting to get water. And that went on three days. Okay, they pulled out and left. Two days later, a hospital ship pulled in and uh, anchored off down pretty good ways from us. This is going to be funny. The second day they was down there, someone got on our intercom and said, Now hear this. The nurses are sunbathing on the flying bridge of the hospital ship. Well, I took care of two anti-aircraft guns, three, three, three fifties up on the bow of the ship. Had them long, magnified sights on them. I cranked around and looked. Sure enough, they were. Now they were had their swimsuits on and everything, but. That's the first ladies we'd seen in a pretty good while, and it was interesting. Well, when the Stars and Stripes, our newspaper, come out, it showed our ship there on the side, broadside picture of it, and anything around was an eyeball, because we had long glasses was strained on it, and the gun sights were on it, and binoculars were on that ship. <laughs> but anyway, the next paper that come out, the next week or ever it was, it showed our ship there, and anything round was eyeball. There's some gun barrels and that. <laughs> so I said, boy, we blew that, didn't we? <laughs> Do you remember the uh, that you said that there were only four distilling ships 
in the Navy. Well, my two men, the Japs done got two of them. What, what, do you remember the name of your ship? Abitan, yeah. It was named after a uh, river in the Philippines. And so it was the USS Abitan. A-B-A-T-A-N, number four, A-W-4. And that, we were the last one. So I, I would imagine that your ship was, uh, I mean, the Japanese, especially if there are only four ships, were... Were you uh, and the Navy probably really wanted to protect your ship because they can function without ammunition, they can run away, but they can't survive without water. No. Or is that the case? I tell me. That, that's one thing that happened that I was wondering why. I was on gangway watch one day, and uh, uh, right after we got there, and uh, here come a destroyer in anchored pretty close to us, and I asked it. Officer of the deck asked, what are you getting here? He said, to help protect us. I said, why? He said, we're the only source of drinking water in this place a lot of people have got. <laughs> so uh, I thought, well, we're more important than I thought we were. So after after uh, they took Oklahoma, uh, well, we, we left uh, Ulithi and went to... Uh, Tack Loban in the Philippines. Stayed there a while, and then we left there and went to Okinawa and the Ruyukas. I can't spell that either. And uh, as well, while we were in Ulithi, something happened. About once a week, some a Japanese scout plane would come somewhere early in the morning. And uh, we'd have to go to general quarters. And uh, he wouldn't get close enough for us to shoot him. We'd just shoot at, just shoot up there to run him off. But one morning he come back down and he had two buddies with him. Suicide planes. Cause he had spotted the Randolph at a light CVE, carrier vessel escort, a light carrier had come in and uh, docked off pretty good ways down there. And uh, one of them hit the Randolph, and uh, I, I think they said it killed five or seven men. I can't remember. But anyway, the tide was out, and this was almost just barely light. And the tide was out, and this other suicide plane flew down and what he thought was a flat top was a coral reef out there, a big long coral reef. <laughs> he plowed in that coral reef and uh, that was the end of him. But anyway, that's uh, about all the bad things that happened. Did, <clears throat> did you ever feel, you know, you, you've said before that when you're in a ship as opposed to on the ground in the infantry or the Marines, whatever, that if when you're on the ground, they're shooting at you, but when you're in the Navy, they're shooting at the ship. Right. Did you ever feel like, man, I'm going to be lucky to get out of here, or was it pretty much, no, I don't have too much to worry about? Oh, no. Uh, let me tell you something else that happened. It wouldn't. A transport come in, and uh, there's a, he had a destroy escort. And when they got in, luckily, the destroyer didn't turn, it, turn his sonar system off, and there had been two suicide submarines come in under that ship, big ship. Mini subs. Yeah. And uh, luckily, he had left his sonar, and when they come out from under there, he picked them up and started dropping depth charges inside the <laughs> anchorage there. And we we didn't know what was going on, and finally they dis uh, disabled. Uh, well, they sunk one, and they disabled the other, and they they come up and got it and got the Japs out of it, and brought it over and tied it off to our boat boom. You know, we had a boat boom out where we could tie our little boats to. And now listen, y'all quit calling ships boats. A boat 
is anything that can be picked up and put on a ship. Now, that's Navy talk. <laughs> Don't call a ship a boat. <laughs> oh. uh, a question's been raised about you were on a distilling ship, and, well, there's probably some boys on that ship that know how to distill something besides water. Uh, that, I mean, if you got all the distilling properties and yeah. the equipment, did you? No, they didn't have any, any of the mash or whatever it took to make it. They probably wouldn't have tried it. <laughs> do, do you have a recipe for mash? That, uh, no. That, that you could have uh, that distilled something along those lines? No, no. Was it ever suggested to you? Well, that, that you there was a lot of wishing. <laughs> Wish we had. But uh, let me finish my end of my deal. When we, when we joined the Navy, if you enlisted, you signed up for the duration in six months. Okay, we went to Okinawa and after the war, we went to Okinawa and uh, stayed there and helped them recover and I don't know what all. But anyway, after the war, they sent us to Shanghai, China. We went up the Yangtze to the Wang Pu, and that's where Shanghai was. But anyway, uh, we were there about three days, and they come in, and they started taking our regular Navy guys off. And they took, my, I had a buddy, he was a first-class gunner's mate. I was a gunner's mate striker until the war was over. For, I was a seaman first. They had three of us. You know, we'd done the cleanup and things on the guns. And that's all we done, took care of the guns. But when we went to sea, they put us up piloting the ship. I asked him, I said, what? He said, all of the men on the deck force have got jobs. Y'all don't have nothing to do when we're at sea, so we're going to put you to work. I said, that's all right with me. <laughs> so I, I piloted the ship. And uh, the... Captain hardly ever come in the pilot house, but he, he one day he come in there and, and I was at the helm. Well, I never did look up my age. Did I? And he looked at me and he said, Son, how old are you? I said, 18, sir. He just grabbed his head like this and turned around one day. See, I, he thought, I got children in here. Running the ship, I know what he thought. I guess, <laughs> but anyway, uh, that's uh, they carried the the regular navy off and sent them home, and maybe we did our six months over there in Shanghai, China, which was interesting because we had a big A-frame train on a crane on the ship. And we unloaded a lot of stuff for the Air Corps, engines and things. And uh, so after about a week later, after they left, uh, one of the officers from the Air, Air Corps come in and said, uh, talk to them. I don't know why he made up this story. He said, we, we need someone up there to help. On, show us how to unload this stuff and store it. And uh, he said, could I pick them out? And they said, well, yeah. So he picked me and Herbert Green. Herbert Green was a, was a he welded, he was a ship fitter. He took care of, when the ships would come alongside, they'd bang up our railings and stuff like that. And uh, he picked me and him and another boy. And uh, I was running that big crane then, and uh, he he got we got on this plane and took off headed for Peking, capital. And uh, we got up there, and he said, "Fellas, I got some news for you." Said we were watching, and said y'all did a lot for us and said uh, we decided we'd give you a little R&R. &R. <laughs> said you're not going to have to do nothing. 
said, we'll keep you up here three days and show you the town and everything. So they did. They showed us everything but the Forbidden City. They wouldn't let us see it. But anyway, uh, after we got to come back home, uh, the pilot that brought us back said, y'all get to see the big Great Wall? And we said, no, we didn't see the Great Wall. He said, oh, it ain't about 40 miles up there. He flew, he went out of the way. He said, we could see the, the Great Wall of China. And then we got on back to Shanghai and that got back into the... I, I'm curious, did you ever think that you, uh, a 17-year-old boy from Dorian, Missouri, would ever find himself in China or wherever else that you, you I mean... Did, did you in, appreciate being able to see all this, or was it like, yes, I just sir. Out of here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, we stopped in the Philippines. Marilyn, go in there and get that. Well, 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 well uh, just uh, keep, keep going. She'll, she'll get in just a minute. Yeah. Uh, what well, was it? You stopped in the Philippines. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was, uh, they, they, they come out there and they, we call them bomb boats with outriggers on the side and, and uh, wanting cigarettes. <laughs> so this she's going to get is, is I got for a carton of cigarettes. It's a Harry Carey dagger. Well, they killed herself with it. A real one? Or yeah. Uh-uh. A... Uh -uh. It's a real one. And a, a fella told me, he said, there's no telling how old that is. said, that, that's a family instrument. And uh, so this Filipino had, this a Jap had committed suicide, and then he found that, and uh, he had it out there to trade it. I traded it for a carton of cigarettes. In the ship service, a carton of cigarettes was 50 cents. Wow. Then, that's just right after the war. Uh, of all the places that you saw when you were in the Navy, what did you find the most interesting and why was it the most interesting? Oh. Or was it the middle of the ocean? <laughs> i tell you what wasn't interesting. We was in a typhoon at Okinawa. Wind 122 miles an hour, waves 85 foot. They'd come all the way over. The, I was at, at the helm. We had to leave out of the harbor. And uh, some of the little ships, after we got out that, that hit, they said, we're taking on what? We're going up on the beach. We're beach. We're sinking and all kinds of things, you know, because that wind and them big waves and everything, you know. And uh, so we got out to sea, and boy, that, the waves had come all the way over the pilot house. And uh, I, was, I was at the helm one day there, and, I mean, doing it, and and uh, captain come in there, and we got in the eye of it, just as calm as it could be. And... Uh, Captain asked the officer of the deck, he said, what's the heading of this? I think he said 212 degrees, sir. He turned around there and he said, helmsman, turn this ship to 212 degrees. I want to get one good night's sleep. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I was scared. Oh boy, that was a, and we was in it five days. We we stayed in that eye till it come up back and caught us, and we had to turn back around, and head into it. But uh, that was uh, so. You, you joined the navy and you saw the world. Yeah, half of it. Yeah. Yep, that was uh, something for a guy as uh, young as I was. Well, I was eighteen then. <laughs> I, I turned 17, 18 as, just after I graduated from boot camp. Yeah. But uh, we wasn't in any, any battles or anything. All those islands had been taken, but we'd come in behind and support 
if they take out of it, we'd come in behind and support, you know, furnishing more water and Well, they drinking. probably wanted you, to, as far from the battle being such a critical ship, uh, your your mission was so critical, they probably wanted you as far away from, didn't want anything to happen to you. Well, we had plenty. We had four anti-aircraft guns, three each 50. That's the biggest fixed ammunition they had. You had the pointer, the trainer, the gun captain, first loader, first, second loader, third loader, hot shell man. That's how it operated, and, it, and uh, we had four of them. We had one five inch thirty eight on the stern, a big one, and four twin forty millimeters. That's in boom, 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 and uh, we had pretty good protection on our, our own. And uh, that was. Had had you been back to? To uh, where you went to boot camp? Yeah. What 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 was it like? Our our it wasn't nothing left but the where, where they got rid of the leavings, <laughs> uh, bed bathroom outfit and things is all is left there. I said, what happened to all these uh, two la two deck uh, buildings that we lived in? You know. A company up here and a company down here, and I believe there were six of them in each camp. But anyway, he said all oh, these uh, these hunting camps and things wanted them, and said they moved them out and said we got rid of them. And I said, how come um, to build all these up here? He said, well, I heard that Miss Roosevelt flew over here and saw this big, huge lake down there and said, that'd be a good place to build, a, to have a naval training station. Said they built six here with hospitals and everything in each one of them. Now, that was a big operation. Mm. So, if you had to do it all over again, would you have gone into the Navy? Or yeah. Say, no, oh, no. Uh-uh. No. No way. No, it was a... Uh, it was interesting, yeah. Well, let me shift gears on you. I, I want to, uh, I, I want to go back before you got in the Navy. Oh, and okay. Growing up, you have said. Now you you had, you were the only son. You had two sisters. Then I did. I had four later. I had. They were born. My sister. I had one sister born twenty nine. She died when she was two. And uh, I had, me and her were born in the 20s. And then they had two girls in the 30s and two in the 40s. <laughs> My two, the ones born in the 40s are still living. The others are, are dead. Uh, the one born in the 40s handicapped, and we've taken care of her all of till she has to have a colostomy bag, and then we put her in the nursing home. She'd been in there how long? Three, I think it was three years in June. Oh, it's been more than that, I thought. But anyway. Well, uh, I, I want to touch on you. You were the only boy. Yeah. You had, you had friends in the Dorena area, specifically the Larkins. Mainly. Uh, t tell, me, tell me about the, your dealings with the Larkins boys? Well, we, uh, they just kind of adopted me, you know. Uh, I'd spend the night with them on the weekend sometimes, and uh, their mother, Miss Annie, she was a dear. I thought a lot of her, and, uh, well, Mr. Rob, too, but uh, they were more like brothers and they were you know strangers and they treated me just like they did each other uh, was that a good thing or a bad well, thing? well sometimes uh, now I know what you want to hear is about the hunting deal they had a place up 
in the, uh, I forget what they call that up there, but anyway, they had a place up there, woods and things, and they go up there and cut wood. Wood was a source of our heat and cooking. Well, they had a, a, a farm all tractor with a trailer, and uh, it, it would move pretty good, but uh, they'd go up there and cut wood and then take it back home down there at Dorena, down there where they lived. And uh, they'd, they'd come by and, and uh, they'd see, I'd see them coming and they'd hold their guns up, we're going hunting, you know. Well, I'd run in and get my gun and get in the go run out there. Well, Bruce never would stop. He'd just slow down. I'd throw my gun up in there, and then I'd jump up on the step that's on the side there. And uh, when I got up there and looked down there, there were saws and axes down there. They said, oh, we're going to have to cut a little stove wood first. Come on. <laughs> so we go up there and cut wood, you know, and uh, do a little hunting. Uh you ever getting involved in any uh, any uh, fights or anything uh, with, uh, with uh, you know just as boys scrapping around or yeah there was a I think they lived on their place named Jones uh, we got into it with two of them and uh, they was about to get the best of us. And Robert said, W.O., if you don't start crying, we're going to get the devil beat out of us. I cleaned that up a little. <laughs> and uh, because when I started crying, why, everybody just, because <laughs> I'd use anything I could get a hold of it if I, if I was losing a fight. <laughs> but anyway, Robert said, you better just start crying or we're going to get back. <laughs> <laughs> so that's uh, one of the stories, but uh, we took care of each other. They took care of me mostly. Uh, there was a, a story that I've heard about. There was uh, help get gather eggs out beneath underneath somebody's house, and she the agreement was they she'd give half the eggs, and yeah. then but you all took half of them. Tell tell me that story. That, Oh, we'd take them and sell them. No, tell, start at the beginning. Who it was, whose house it was. Oh, gosh. Who was involved. I, I can't remember that. Well, it was, it wasn't, it was Miss Williams' store. Oh, yeah. Uh, well, but you all would. Yeah, that's where we'd take them and sell them. But, but. But we'd, uh, it'd be several places we'd get, gather the eggs up. Well, well tell the story for the best you can remember on how, what the, the general plan of operation. You go in. And she would tell you if that if you because the hens would build nests under the house and yeah. raid. Tell, tell me what you remember on that. Well, uh, now Marshall was the smallest, and he some he had to go in some places we couldn't go in and get the eggs, but we just get them and put them in a basket and or bucket or something and. Take them up there to Miss Williams, and uh, I forget what we got for them. One much. <clears throat> well, here's here's what I was going for. The this is the way I heard it. Now I, I, you tell me, you, you correct me, that because the houses were built off the ground, they were they were on blocks or whatever. Yeah. And hens would get underneath their, these houses and they'd build nests and they'd lay eggs. Yeah. The way I heard this is that you all would go underneath there and get all the eggs and you'd split them. You'd, take, you'd put half of them away. And then when you gave the, the owner the eggs, they'd say, well, I'm going to give you half. So you ended up with three quarters of the eggs. Now, is that the way it, it went or... Uh, because then, evidently it was. I can't remember exactly. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. I guess we did. Yeah, yeah. They because they eventually got traded for either red dot cigars or red dot cigarettes. No, we didn't. Know, it wasn't no red dot. It's cigars. 
we rolled our own cigarettes. <laughs> uh, I think you had told a story about uh, the the Larkins boys, and I think you were down there with them. You were all chopping wood, and every everybody was smoking cigarettes. And Mr. Rob had slipped down there because he didn't want anybody smoking. He said you couldn't see for the fog of the smoke. It, it was like a <laughs> hey, and Marshall was six, and but but do you remember that story? Probably, but not exactly what happened. Well, uh, apparently. He said something to Marshall. Yeah, he said, Marshall, he said, we're, because when he walked up, everybody had a cigarette, and they dropped them, and he ran over to Thomas and said, hey, here, here, you dropped this, gave him back the cigarette. Yeah. But he asked Marshall, he said, Marshall, who was six, he says, were you smoking? And he said, no, I quit a long time ago. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know if you remember that. Yeah, before. I do now. Uh. Uh, but do you my, remember enough to tell about it, or just uh, not not really? To, no, I, I didn't remember enough to tell about it. I couldn't. Well, do, do you remember any other stories about fights, or you know? Uh, we didn't do all that much fighting. Uh, you know, it was just, fishing excursions. Oh anything? gosh, yeah, we fished and hunted a lot. But uh, I'll tell you a funny one when you get the camera off of it. Well, go ahead and tell it now. I can always turn there. Let me turn the camera off. Okay, go ahead. I can't remember if it was Bruce or Robert. I had to go to the bathroom out in the woods. And he got to a point he wouldn't pass. He wouldn't go out. He got him a stick. <laughs> And dug it out. So, if that's what you want to know, stuff like that. <laughs> but I think it was Robert. <laughs> well, were there any particular? Now, you were about the same age as, as Thomas, the oldest, and and Bruce. I was, I was a little older than Bruce. See, in '37 flood, they lost a grade. Well, I was living in Battle Creek, and I I was a great I, I caught up with Thomas. Well, they lost a grade because they had to cancel school uh, right. because of the flood. Right. Okay. So, uh, me and Thomas were in the same grade to, all the way through high school, and Thomas had a, a memory problem too. And I read constantly. I'd get library books and read them, you know. If we had, if we had a, a book report, Buddy Boy would say, W.O., have you read any good books lately? And I said, well, I, I'd, if I, I'd tell him one I hadn't told him before. I said, yeah, I got it. He said, tell me about it. Because he'd take what I told him and turn it in for his book report. So... I, I tell him, and, you know, and everything. He said, you know what? You can tell a story so good I can just see it. I said, well, I'm glad of that. So he'd make a report on that. That's how he made his book report. So <laughs> but, what, was there any, were you close to uh, all the, the boys there, or were you, uh, was, was there some that you're, you felt closer to, uh, whether it's Thomas or Bruce or Marshall well, or I, I, I guess Thomas because he took care of me. You know he uh, when we started high school, I, I was little, and they started picking on me. You know, Thomas told him, "said boy, I'm gonna tell you now. I was raised with that boy. You better let him alone, because if you don't, and you get him mad." He'll slip up on you with a ball bat and knock your damn brains out. He said, and so they started backing off. <laughs> was, was it true? No. <laughs> if I started crying, it was. <laughs> if I started crying, it. Cause I, I, I just lose it. Uh. The uh, 
Now there there are there were a few girls around there, but you were young. Uh, you, now you weren't married when you went in to. Oh no! Uh uh no. no. Now you didn't have a serious girlfriend back before you went in. To oh, this nothing serious. No, I had one one of the girls got a hold of my class ring, wouldn't give it back to me for a pretty good while. Uh, she, Rita Glenn Kofer, that's Bobby Williams' cousin. Now, Bobby was pretty close to us. He, he, we were with him, him a lot. He was, he didn't have any brothers or sisters, and he's kind of a spoiled fella, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was it. Bobby Williams was was that his mother's store? Store, or, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. His dad and mother together, and then they got a divorce because Mr. Williams got to going with this single girl, and they got a divorce. But she run it by herself. With that's Bobby. almost unheard of for somebody to get a divorce back back then, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah. He was eat up with it, I guess. Well, now let's talk about after you got out of the navy. Now you you've already mentioned that you had some firefighting skills, but that you didn't go in the fire department uh, right away. What did you do when you got out of the navy? Well, my folks had moved from Dorena. Let's see to Benton. My dad, but that's between Saxon and Cape Girardeau. Cape Girardeau, yeah. It's a little town, but it was a county seat of Scott County, Benton. But anyway, they had moved there while I was in service. Because my dad had planted a crop and the backwater got it. Well, he planted one next year and the backwater got it. So he headed for the hills, and Benton is up on the hill. That's the first hill he come to, so he, he found a little 80-acre farm out there, and he bought it. Later on, he put in a grocery store up there and did really good. And, and uh, that's where they lived when I got out of the Navy, out on a little farm out there out, off of after Benton a little ways. And uh, then later on, they uh, they sold it and moved in that store building. And but but you never moved back after you went to the Navy. You never made it back to Dorena again. Well, you I go. There. No, uh, uh, no. I go down. My granddad had a store down there. And I go down there and stay with him a lot. And uh, I'd help him in the store, dust and do whatever he wanted. You know. I know one day I was up on a ladder and he said, W, if you fall off of there, fall on your head so you won't sprain your ankles. I said, well, he just wants you keeping keeping you motivated. <laughs> uh, so what what was, uh, and, and by the way, you're, when, uh, are you getting tired? If, if you no, uh-uh, uh, no. Uh, let, me, let me move this microphone just a little bit because it, it, it's moved down just a skosh, and I want to pull it back up here. Uh, I think that'd be fine. A am I crushing your pillows no, here? No, I'm trying to get them out of your way, <laughs> so you'd be more comfortable. Uh, so, what was your first job when you got out of the navy? Well, I, I helped my dad. That farm we got down there—it's in. The, if you go into Big Oak store. Our farm's on the left there, that one. And uh, he he bought a farm up there over on the other road over there by the Markham store. And uh, that's where we clear up all that, them trees and everything and run into them roots and stumps. And, and uh, no, that was before I went in the Navy, though. But... Uh, he sold it and uh, bought that up there at Benton, and they lived up there for a long time. And he he put in a grocery store up there, and did real good. And 
So when I got out of service, most of those people up there were were Dutchmen, you know. Up at Benton? Yeah. And they were really good people, you know, and they had helped They'd help Dad a lot while I was gone. But anyway, and uh, that's where I started. And I'd go down my granddad's and stay and help him. And Were you running mules or driving tractors? Tractor. tractor. Yeah, I had tractors in. <laughs> did, did you care much for working mules or did you do very much uh, working, driving mules? Oh, oh. Let me tell you a good one. Lloyd Hall had a pair of horses. One of them, old Shorty, was a Mustang, he said, because he had a mustache. But anyway, uh, that horse, he got on him and he threw him and broke some ribs. So he sold it to Dad, sold them to Dad. Uh, old Bob was a big horse and Shorty was a little wiry horse. Well, I had to have them get rid of them mules, them classy horses were on. And I, I'd take old, I could take old Shorty and was sowing seed and I'd say, haw, he'd step over one step or yay, he'd step over a step. He, he'd train like that and uh, Dad told me, he said, don't you get on that horse now because he threw the Lord Hall and broke his rib. Well, you know, that was the wrong thing to tell me. I got him out and I leaned over him one day and got on his back. He turned around and looked at me, you know, and I said, uh-oh. Well, I got on him and rode him and never had a bit of trouble. But, uh, so tell me the difference between G and Hall. G, which direction? Yeah, he's right and Hall is his left. G and Hall. Yes, so when somebody does a G haul just right, that means they don't know. The yeah, right. Yeah. So, how did you end up over in Paducah being a firefighter? Well, uh, my dad had that grocery store up there, and I went to college one year on the GI Bill. Where'd you go to college? Harding. Huh? Harding, free department. Freed Hardman? Yeah. In Tennessee? Yeah. Uh -huh. You went to Freed Hardman? Uh-huh. Uh, over in Chester County, Henderson. Henderson, yeah. Uh, one year, and then mothers want me to be a preacher. Did you want to be a preacher? No. <laughs> but I went over there anyway. It's a, it's a biblical school, you know. Church of Christ, I think. So. But anyway... I come back and I didn't have nothing to do. And Dad said, W.O., he said, uh, you got some schooling left. And I said, yeah. He said, uh, there's a, said, I talked to this meat salesman. He said, there's a school in, uh, what was it? I'm, I'm losing it. In uh, Toledo, Ohio. And, uh, he said, a meat cutting school. I said, would you go up there? I said, they're coming out with this pre-packaging and said, maybe you go up there and learn how to do it. I said, yeah, I'll go. Well, I was married then, I believe. But anyway, I went up there and I got the training he wanted me to get and to come back, showed him everything and he took over and then a salesman come in one day said, they're looking for meat salesman. I said, uh, would you consider Armour Packing Company? I said, well, yeah. So I went up there and went through the training that they had. And uh, when they was building this plant out here, uh, the salesman here got so busy that they shipped me over here to uh, help him, you know. And uh, he said, uh, I, I didn't have no word to stay, but I had a a distant cousin. I said, George Barkley, he was a detective lieutenant here in Paducah. And 
I lived with him. His wife had just died. And I stayed with him. He had a daughter, a young daughter, and I, he worked nights, and I stayed with, with, uh, to take care of her. And uh, so I got on the armor packing company, and they got so busy over here they need another salesman to ship me over here. And I stayed with him till. Uh, I moved over here, got my family over here, and, and uh, rented a house. And then I bought a house, 2112 Harrison, lived there 43 years. And it's so close together, a neighborhood that me and my neighbors that use the same driveway. And then this building here, we uh, Ruby played the lottery. Ruby's your wife. Yeah, Ruby, my wife, Ruby Nell. And she hit the lottery for $100,000. Well, I had saved up enough. We didn't get that much, I think 64000 But anyway, got enough to buy this house. There's a guy being transferred. He worked for the government, and he's being transferred to California. Well, Albert Jones, the mayor, told me, he said, that man found out he's leaving. He's talking to me and said he started crying. He just said, <laughs> I said, I don't blame him <laughs> leaving here going to California. But I bought it from him and because there was no one on either side of me for a half a block. And uh, So did all these people move in after they found out you were here? Oh, that, there's none of these houses over three years old. Really? Right here on each side of me. Yeah, they're they're just they just built them and uh, run all of their molds up here on me. <laughs> they start building their molds, move out. I need to stop for just a moment. Okay. And that I grew up hearing uh, of my grandfather Paul Larkins was telling my dad I was going to go down and see Buddy Boy. I didn't know who he was talking about for a no. while. I mean, it's just, he's going to go down and see Buddy Boy. And yeah. He's going to go see Uncle Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, you know, it's it's all a matter of perspective. And well, yeah, that, uh, it's, he grew up that way, you know. Of course, I've known him for years, and that's the first thing I knew, Buddy Boy, Buddy Boy. And uh, he was uh, my... Well, now, Robert and Marshall were younger, you know, and uh, especially Marshall. Uh, but Robert, they didn't come no tougher than Robert, your daddy. <laughs> How so? I mean, he, he could take care of himself now when it comes to anything. <laughs> Among us, you know. We'd wrestle and scuffle, you know, and for, just for not mad, but aggravating. <laughs> so <laughs> he didn't put up with much aggravating. <laughs> right, go ahead and describe each of the boys, uh, each of the Larkins boys, as you remember them, because you say that they were like brothers. So, so you start, but start at Thomas and work your way down. You know, Tom. They were so different. Thomas was kind of a. I don't know what you call it. He he uh, he was kind and you know nice, and, and uh, then there was Bruce. <laughs> Bruce was always deviling you somewhere or other. <laughs> he played tricks on you and this first one thing or another. And Robert, he was kind of I don't know. He was. Uh, he wasn't selfish, but he was could take care of himself. You know, he didn't depend on anybody. And and Marshall, he was just little, you know, and doing whatever they told him to do. <laughs> but uh, they were all different. Just. But they always had your back. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Or whatever. I was just like a brother now. Yeah, they, uh... Do you remember much about their, their sisters, the girls? Oh, yeah. 
uh, Laverne and Georgie, I mean uh, Laverne and uh, Gretchen, they, Gretchen was the oldest in Laverne, and uh, they helped Miss Annie all, you know, cook and do everything. And then uh, the younger girls, uh, Lavelle and Georgie, they were younger, but uh, they were nice kids. Polite. But how, how would you describe Mr. Rob, Paul Larkin? <laughs> oh, 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 I don't know. I think he was in the moonshining for a while. Would you say he's a rough fellow, Ed? Huh? Would you say he was a rough fellow? Uh, he wasn't, no, he wasn't mean or nothing, but he was, I don't know. I liked him. He, uh, he was kind of devilish. He did trick you and play tricks on you and, you know, but, uh. What about, uh, his wife? Annie? Miss Annie, I loved her, uh, like a aunt or something, you know. She was just so nice. She was a Bennett, you know. And uh, all of her brothers were moonshiners. And uh, I guess that's where Mr. Rob got acquainted with her. <laughs> and he don't know how lucky he was because she was the whole sweetest thing. Oh, nice. She was Miss Annie. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> Let, let's talk about how you ended up in the firefighting department over here in Paducah. Now, you were a meat cutter. You were working at the armor uh, as a salesman. Uh -huh. uh, so how do you get from meat packing and cutting meat to becoming a firefighter? Uh, I sold meat for about two years. And uh, on Tuesday, my first call was in Princeton. You know, that's about 50 some miles. And I went all the way across the Fredonia, Crane, Marion, back down through the lakes. I had 42 calls that one day. And uh, two years, I was wore out. And on the weekends, you didn't have your time. You had to send in how much tonnage you got, how much canned goods. And it took all weekend. To, you didn't have any time for yourself. And uh, they got here where they wouldn't nobody go on police and fire department. They was making that big money out there at the plant. And I was wanting something. I had a pension. And they had a good pension here. So being uh, trained in firefighting a little, I got on and hired me right away. And you had to work your day way off a switchboard then. When you called a number, you got the fireman. Uh, I had to know, learn how, who, we had five companies, and I had to learn what each company's territory was. So if we had just a car fire or something, you'd know who to send, you know. Well, I did that for two years, and uh, I was... Uh, when I went to high school, me and Thomas, me and Buddy Boy, took tapping. The boys never heard of taking tapping. They, oh, you sissy, I go back with it. Well, me and Thomas went where the ladies were. <laughs> and yeah, the girls was all in the tapping class. But anyway, we learned how to tap. Well, when they found out at the fire department I could tap, I... I'd be operating the switchboard. I'd also be doing secretarial work for the chief. Well, one one of the boys got hurt and wanted to take the job I had. And uh, well, before that, the, I was getting ready to my seniority. I could get off of it, and the chief said, uh, "Green, if I got you a little too much pay, would you stay on the switchboard?" He didn't want to lose his secretary. I said, "Well, yeah." So I stayed on a little while, and this boy got hurt at a fire and and couldn't work, and he wanted to know if I'd give him. I said, "Yeah, yeah, I want to get on the floor." 
Well, I was on the floor for just a little while, and I made engineer driving, you know. And I was an engineer 10 years, and I made captain. I was a captain 10 years, and I made assistant chief. I was assistant chief eight years before I retired. And that's the history of my... And here's a funny one. We was fighting fire on Jefferson Street one night, one night in the fall of the year, and it was dark, and uh, the fire was coming through the attic, so I got up on the roof and was walking over there, and I got in front of the window to stick my holes in there, and when I stepped, all of the grit had gone off of that roofing and I took off down the roof and fell off the roof but I didn't hit the ground somebody had left the frame for the window air conditioner in it and my butt went down in that thing and caught me kept me from hitting the ground and uh, it was dark and I, I got to holler and Delbert Reader were you stuck? Yeah, I was stuck in there. My knees was against my head was against my knees. So your butt was down in there like a cork. And uh, Devil Reed run got a ladder run over and got on me, tried to push me out. He couldn't push me out, so they had to have two get above me and pull pull while he pushed me up. Well, they took me to the hospital. No broken bones. Well, I thought I was sore, boy. And uh, I thought, well, I'll work it out. And the more I worked, the worse it got. They ended up sending me to Memphis. And that doctor down there found out, and he chewed me out. He said, you ought to have been off work two weeks or more. He said, you've pulled all the muscles and, lo and uh, ligaments loose in your back and, and this, your uh, uh, hip socket is torn out. And uh, <laughs> But anyway... Uh, I got all right and went back, went back to work. And uh, was that the worst you had ever been hurt on the job yeah, during your career? Yeah, yep, yeah, it was. But uh, so that that's about as close of a bad call as you ever had. Oh yeah, while, while you're yeah. firefighting, no, no other close calls while you're firefighting. Yeah, I, I sure was thankful that man left that thing in the window though. I thought the good Lord was watching out for me. Yeah. But all of the grit had been worn off of that, and it was just tar paper, you know, with water on it. And when I started, I had on rubber boots, and when I started, I did more further I went, and I remembered to turn loose, and finally to turn loose of the holes. And the, <laughs> but anyway, that's a... Uh, I, I'm curious when you look back now. You you just turned 94. Is, is that you're you're 94, not 95, correct? Yeah. Right. When you look back, you just I mean you grew up on a farm. You've been in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. You've been to China, Philippines. You got you know you were fighting, putting your life on the line with, you know, in the firefighting, because you never know when you go out. Do you ever look no. back and say, man, I was, I was a lucky guy? Or you think, nah, luck had nothing to do with it. Yeah. Yep, lucky. Uh, let me tell you something, I'm on brag. When I was an engineer in the fire department, the chief was Tommy Rothrock, and what, whatever, had, had brought him to do this. I don't. He had people. He had the fire department members vote to see who the best engineer in the fire department was. Well, I got it. Well, they voted me in, you know, and uh, I, I I can't figure out why he done it because I had to prove it. I'd go in the morning. Valves would be left open, things. Uh, booster tank would be low in water. That went on for about a week, and they finally got. 
I didn't even tell my captain about it. I didn't tell nobody. Well, they didn't, uh, ever who were doing it, got tired of it, I guess, and quit. So they wasn't accomplishing nothing. <laughs> so they were, they were trying to trip you up. He was trying to make me look bad, see, because I'd won the, uh, I, that was, I, I really got a kick out of that. I and, well, when you look back on your life, how, how would you sum up your, your life? I mean, you, you've lived, you've lived uh, some adventures in your life. Oh, uh, yeah. How, how would you sum it up if you had to just sum it up for, you know, just in a, in a couple of sentences? How would you describe the life of W.O. Green in a nutshell? Pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I've had a good life. And uh, enjoyed it. I thank God every day for my longevity <laughs> and uh, the life I've had, uh, my family and friends. It's just uh, I've. Uh, Tried to contribute, you know. And my dad drilled in me there's two things. It's better to be 30 minutes early on a job as two minutes late. And always do more than is expected of you. Cause they'd hire anybody that'll just do all, just do all everything they can. So that's that's how I've uh, tried to live. And there's one thing: if I'd have, if he'd caught me lying or stealing, <whistles> Katie barred the door. <laughs> it's been <laughs> bad, and uh, so I've uh, tried to live uh, honest. Life, I've never been in any trouble. And I've enjoyed it and I'm thankful and had a lot of good friends. That's what it's all about. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I can say them, them little boys, the Larkin boys, are like brothers, you know. They, they adopted me. <laughs> We had a lot of, and we, back when we had slang shots, boy, we got good with them things. How good were you? Oh, I don't, we could sit bottles up out there and bake them. <laughs> uh, well, uh, that's what I wanted to talk with you about, and you did a, a great job, and 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 I will tell you, I didn't have a bit of gray hair before I married my wife. <laughs> and I told her, and, and it's amazing what you said because I told her for years, I'm the kind of person, I'd rather be 30 minutes early than five minutes late, even two minutes late. And my wife, my wife will be late to her own funeral. <laughs> she, she will be. And she says she can't help it and but I do tell people I said I didn't have a bit of gray hair before I married that woman, <laughs> and and I will tell you she and I both had starter marriages. It's kind of like a starter house. Oh, yeah. And so, but uh, anyway, just I, I, I better turn this off because she might hear the recording and then come back. I, oh, okay. I, I, go, go ahead. I saved two people's lives in the fire department. One, uh, there used to be an elderly lady here in town that was in a wheelchair, and her what son. What this one told? Huh? Why didn't you want this story told? Well, I'd be bragging. And, uh, <laughs> okay, so the, the start again. The... She was in this wheelchair, and her son, who was a grown man, he was blind. He pushed her all over town. And, but we had a fire in an apartment building. And the 
at night, and uh, it, it oh man, it's smoky. And the ma manager told me, said that that old lady and her son was in the front apartment. There was three apartments on each side of this hall, and said, uh, see if you can get up there and check and see if she got out. I said, okay. So I went up the back steps, got up there, man, it was smoky. So I got on my hands and knees and started down the hall, and I run into a woman laying on the hall floor there. And I got a hold of her, and, pulled, and she's laying on top of a man underneath her. So I pulled him to the head of the stairs and got on my walkie-talkie and told him to send guys up. I've got bodies up here. So they come up, and they got her. And I said, tell uh, Curly to get her on the resuscitators. He's going to bring her around. And uh, so they did it. <laughs> Tony Seal come up with his eyes with that. And uh, they carried her down. And I went back to get him. And I grabbed him by the belt. They were not fully dressed. He had his pants on but no shirt. Had an undershirt on. So I grabbed him by the belt, and when I pulled up on he grunted, uh, and I got him to the head of the stairs there, and they come back up and got him, took him down, and I said, y'all come back up. I said, that old lady is in that front apartment over there, and uh, so they come back up, and we started down through there, and I, I couldn't go. I had too much. I done got too much smoke. <laughs> And uh, I said, y'all go down there and see. So I stayed there at the head of the town. And they come back dragging that man and uh, that, her son. And uh, they, they said, she's up there in the wheelchair. She's dead. Well, she's, she's up in that hot smoke, you know, and she just got too much of it. But they took him down there and, and resuscitated all three of them people. And I never did know their names. <laughs> were, were you awarded a, a you know citation for no or no? Or just, that, that was just, that just among us. We didn't tell anybody. But, uh, no. But it's got to have a, a certain sense of of pride that you that you know you just you're doing your job. And you save some lives because that's what you were doing. Yeah, as a firefighter, you put your for. life on the line to, <laughs> to save others. That's like a woman asked me. We was in waiting somewhere. I don't remember the doctor's office. So don't it, don't it piss you off to have to wait like this? I said, No, ma'am. I used to wait for a living. <laughs> <laughs> she said, What? <laughs> I told her, I said, I work on the fire department. I just wait to go to work when the fire comes in. <laughs> <laughs> that, now that's funny. Uh, all those guys are just the brotherhood, you know. They just, just like you know, police officers are. They are all brother. We depend on each other for saving your butt. Huh? Yeah, Christmas dinners. I don't know if they had one this year, but remember last year I, I went with you to your retirement dinner. Yeah. I mean, they, the guys that work now honor the retirees. And uh, that's always special. Well, we work 24 on, 24 off most of my time. And you'd have a Kelly day. A, a Kelly day? What's a uh, Kelly day? We were work. they were working every other day. And the, uh, the representative from Ohio, or Senator from Ohio, said that's not right. The man needs a day off. Let's give them a day off that they won't, uh, like my Kelly day was Monday. And the senator that made this law was named Kelly. He's the one that got us the day off. Or got, and it's a Kelly day. And my Kelly day was Monday. My crew would work. It was four of us on a crew. There'd be three there all the time, sometimes four, when we had a, had our Kelly day. And uh, so that's... Uh, so did you, you lived at the firehouse uh, a couple days a week. I mean, you had to be there. Every other day. 
every day you was there 24 hours. So is that how come your marriage lasted so long because you were gone? After yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I worked on the river a while. But you worked, now, I didn't know that you worked on the river. Yeah, I worked on a river for the Simpson Oil Company out of Charleston. They had four boats. They had uh, Harry Simpson Jr. and the Gladys Simpson with 800 horse. I was on the Harry Simpson Jr. No, I was on the Gladys. And they had two bigger boats. But those I was on, we had a one Martin Barge hauling gas. We didn't have to double trip or nothing, break our toe or nothing. We just keep going where we was going. We go down to Little, go down to Arkansas and load up and come back up and wherever they needed gas was. So we sometime up in Illinois and different places. Now was this gasoline or yeah. natural gas or like gasoline? Yeah. This is gasoline. It wasn't it's, pressurized. It's it Simpson Oil Company service most of these stores, you know. Uh, but uh, anyway, the I had her was born, and I was away from them, and I couldn't stand it. But the captains found out I had been on a ship and was, had operated the steering and everything, and they was teaching me how to operate the towboat. And I got where I would, and they just sat back on the bench there and watched me operate the towboat, you know. And Captain Wise lived out here at Commerce over in Missouri, out in Benton. And the other one was Captain Hooter lived in Arkansas. And uh, me and him got along pretty good. But anyway, uh, Captain Wise, his daughter, was going to be graduating high school, and he wanted off. And uh, we come up, and he's got off at Memphis, and his wife picked him up to take to go to graduation. And that left Captain Hooter, who had been on the all-night uh, pilot to be pilot in another 12 hours, you know. But anyway, we got out, got off and got back out in the river. He said, uh, Green, get up here and take over for me. I'm going to get, had a big bench back there. I said, I'm going to lay down. I said, sit, nap a little. I said, if we meet anybody, wake me up. I said, okay. Because you'd have to give them signals, you know. Well, I didn't meet nobody. And that's a new matter. We got up and we was almost Columbus. We got home by Hickman, and, and he woke up. I guess all oh, two hours anyway he'd slept, or maybe longer than that. But anyway, he woke up and he said, "Where we at, Green?" I said, "Oh, we up the river, pretty good way." Where? I said, "We almost to Columbus." He said, "What? What the hell are you talking about?" I said, "Well." I said, you are sleeping so good. Why would I wake you up? I said, I ain't had any, any problems. And uh, he said, well, he said, I'll take over now. But he was surprised that we had got that far without him waking up. Well, where, you say Charleston was, it, I mean, where was your home base? Was it like Birds Point or where were you? Because that's almost a Cairo. But you say you were based out of Charleston, Missouri. Yeah. Well, where was your... That's where the office was. Oh, okay. So you didn't have a, a loading facility uh, or anything like that uh, off of... Uh, I was trying to think if there was a place uh, along... You know, all, all them, like New Madrid, and we'd play, drop there sometimes. we just drop... we just leave our barge there and go out and, t and uh, tie off and wait till they got the barge pumped out. Sometimes we just stay with it, but most of the time they get loose from it. And um, that's the way it was. It, well, when uh, you went to work, huh? when you went to work uh, on the barge, I mean on the towboat, where did you get on it to begin with? Cape. Okay, so you, you, it, you were, was Cape your home port? Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah. And you get it? Yeah. I think it's always. Well, I, I tell you what, I think, uh, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think we got what you say that you, you had a lot of fun growing up with it and you made it yourself. How, how so? Uh, well, we entertained ourselves, you know, with, uh, we didn't have, we finally got a, Mr. Mr. Williams got a movie down there at the arena, but most of the time we just had to come up with something to entertain ourselves, you know. Well, what, tell me ways that you all entertained yourselves when you were growing up in Dorina. Hunting, fishing, swimming. In the blue it's, hole? Huh, in the blue hole, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I was taught to swim, uh, the Cardin boys, or Dick and them, they taught me to swim. They took me to the blue hole and just threw me in. <laughs> Dad, Dad, Robert, said he almost drowned in the blue hole. Uh, he, he said he got a cramp. He said I was lucky to get out of there. Yeah. He was swimming across the blue hole and I said he didn't think he was going to make it. The blue hole was fed from the river. When the levee broke one time, down there, I guess it cut a hole up through the rocks and things to come up out there, and the, it was clear, crystal clear. Really? Yeah, or blue, it's, that's where it got its name, it looked blue. Well, you know, there were times, I, I was told that uh, you drink out of, the, if you're away from the house, didn't have any water, drink out of the Mississippi, yeah, but you, uh, you you said you've done that, but yeah. places that you wouldn't drink. Oh, yeah. Uh, Where, uh, I think well, said. see, it run. The river run, and when you get to one that gets stagnant and moss and all that in it, it's don't Such taste. Is. Don't taste good. <laughs> Mosquito larva. No. <laughs> it's, it's a tadpole. It's, yeah, you don't want to be drinking a tadpole. Well, um, well I'm going to shut the camera off. And oh, I, th I thought it was off. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Actually, 